please. Father, as we approach your word, we come with reverence and humility. God, we want our hearts to be changed. We don't want to be church people who just come here and go through the motions, maybe even give a little money, maybe sign up for something and enjoy the lights and the music and then leave those same church people. God, I I want to come here as a failed sinner, a, a wicked man in need of your grace, because I know when I come with that heart to your word, I always, always, always find mercy and healing and redemption and love, and I leave here a changed man. And so I pray for everyone in this room, everyone who's listening online, that you would change us by the power of your spirit through the preaching of your word. Let us leave here different. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, well, I I want to just give another thanks to everybody who helped with the decorations. This looks absolutely gorgeous. I just, I love Christmas. We are November 1st people. We're not ashamed of that. We get excited when the the pumpkins start showing up because we know they will soon be rotted away and Christmas will be here. Uh, I love, I love Christmas. I love the trees. I love the stories. I think my favorite character in the Christmas story is a little bit different, maybe a Uh, Well, he's a little bit under the radar. It's Joseph. Uh, Joseph, what a man. Not a lot is written about Joseph. His story isn't dramatized much. He's usually just the guy on the right in the manger scene. But Joseph has an incredible testimony from the one simple act that he did when he decided that he was not going to put his wife to shame. I think we don't understand that as much in our culture today, uh, where, where marriage isn't really as big of a deal as it used to be, and getting pregnant out of wedlock isn't something that's kind of looked down on anymore in our society, but in Joseph's time, everywhere he went, he would have faced ridicule. For him to accept Mary, who came to him with this crazy story, and said, I'm still a virgin, but the spirit Spirit of God has overcome me and, and put this child in me for his faith to believe that story and then for him to go through the process. Everywhere Joseph went, there, there would be some mean guy, some town drunk, some, some just, well, let's call him, the theological term is a jerk, who, who would say, oh, there's, there's Joseph, the wife of the virgin. And Joseph just pressed on. And he loved his wife faithfully, he raised his son faithfully, and he stood up and he stood in the gap and took all of the hate and all of the fire that the people could, could, could put at him because Joseph was willing to stand for somebody who the rest of society was willing to marginalize, to castigate, and to throw out. See, in that society, Mary would have been relegated to second or third class citizen. You come to me with that crazy story about a virgin birth. No, no, Mary. No, you are now tainted goods. You are not part of society anymore. And and Joseph is the picture of who his son Jesus would become. That one who stands in the gap who quietly perseveres and cares for those who the rest of society would rather not care about. And Joseph is a picture of what we are called to do because there are plenty of people even today, they may not be the same kind of people, but some of them are, but there are even people in our church who the rest of society would just rather wash their hands of. I don't, I don't want to put in the effort. I don't want to put in the work. I don't want, I don't want to go through the hard details of, of understanding and knowing that person and getting my hands dirty because it's just too much and I would rather not. Maybe some government organization can help that person. Maybe some charitable society can, can be there for, for those people. And today we're going to look at one particular type or class of person that we are called to love when the rest of society would just rather forget about. 
or relegate to a sad and worthless existence. Open with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're in our framework series. Next week, we are going to start our adoration series. I'm looking forward to that, but we're going to just kind of put a little button on this right now with our, our framework series. And Paul is framing for young Pastor Timothy the role that he is going to play as this pastor of this young church. And what's really interesting is that uh, how Paul frames it up. I want to read just the first two verses of chapter 5. He says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. You know, Paul could have framed the role of pastor as a business relationship. We think of it today as a, maybe a CEO position. And he could have told Timothy, you're in charge. You're the head guy. You make the decisions. You are the chief executive, and it's your job to run that church. But he didn't. Paul could have used a government analogy. He could have said, uh, you're going to be the, the emperor, we would say the president, or, or, or you would be all of Congress, or, or maybe, Timothy, you're supposed to get uh, a group of senators and, and a group of other governors and kind of legislate, and there should be checks and balances between you, and, and try to come to a consensus. He didn't. He could have used a military analogy. Every pastor at some point in their life has wished that Paul used a military analogy, right? He, he could have said, just give the order, and if they don't listen, what do you do with people in the military who don't listen? I don't know, you throw it overboard or, or in pre- whatever they do. Uh, take, derank them, right? Some sort of uh, awful punishment. And you're the general, Timothy. He didn't do that. Paul chooses the idea of family to describe the church. This brand new thing that Jesus Christ has created with his resurrection from the dead. This group of people who are brought out of their sin and into his glorious light. He says these people should be thought of and organized like a family. You know, there's a lot of analogies, a lot of ways we can go with that, but there's a couple things that I want to think about when we talk about what it means to be a family, when you have father and mother and brothers and sisters. Uh, I hope that the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of family is love. Love is, is typically what binds families together, and I hope that you, like I do, have wonderful memories of uh, joyful events, birthday parties, and Easter, and Christmas, and big celebrations with families that, that go through a lot of joy and laughter, and I can just think back getting together with my cousins, right, and, and all playing games, and my grandpa's here, we would play at his house and play in his pool or at our other great grand, uh, grandparents' house, and we just had so much fun. But you know, the other thing that comes to mind, and probably all of us can relate to this when you think about family, is obligations, right? The things that you have to do, reunions, grad parties, When June comes around, your schedule, your Saturdays get busy. Weddings, you might be one of those people, the last wedding you enjoyed was your wedding, right? But there's also the serious addictions, or the the serious things, the hard obligations. Being with your brother or sister or mom or dad when they're battling addiction, Sticking with your family, even when they are falling apart and loving those people who hurt you because they're your blood. When they're going through financial distress, when relationships are torn apart, when divorce happens and still being there and loving your family. See, the joy and the love are what characterize uh, family. They're, They're what you remember about your family. But the obligation and the duty and fulfilling that duty is what makes you family. That's what keeps you together, right? When, when you are there for each other, when you're in the hospital, when you're at the grad parties, when you're in the weddings, when you pick up the phone and call somebody because they're going through a hard time, that's what makes family more than just a group of people who get together. 
That's what it means to be the church. And that's how Paul is framing this up. So the rest of the chapter that we're going to look at is going to be governed by this idea of family. And the application I just want to draw is that you ought not to run from obligations. There are obligations in your family at home. There are obligations here at church. There are duties that need to, that need to be uh, fulfilled. There are things that need to happen for this family to function. And it's very easy to sit, I'm not going to pick on any of you, but to sit in the back row and, and to be there for just the fun part and then leave. But we're not the family of God unless we're also fulfilling the obligations that he set before us. We're loving people. We're being there for those who are hurting. And there's one particular obligation we're going to talk about today that has been critical to the church from the very beginning. Let's look at verses 3, and I'm going to read all the way through 16. And then we'll go through it little by little. Paul says, Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should uh, learn first to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list, for when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, and they want to marry, uh, overcome their dedication to Christ, then they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves, because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house, and not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some, in fact, have already turned to Satan. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, she should continue to help them, and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. In ancient times, widows, women whose husbands had died, were in a a very different situation than they are now. Husbands' estates, and this is for a, a woman whose husband has died and she did not have a son particularly, okay? A woman's husband estate would not automatically go to her when her husband died. Today, if your husband dies, obviously all of his possessions are yours because maybe you have joint ownership or you're next in line. In in Paul's day, that didn't automatically happen. She could be awarded something, but that was up to courts. Uh, Women could not stand on their own in court. They had to have a man there representing them in most situations. And so very often what would happen to these poor women who who could not, uh, literally could not stand up for themselves in the legal system is that people would use that legal system against them. And what they had could be taken from them very easily by crooks and swindlers. So there were two groups of people that the church was supposed to care for from the very beginning, and that is orphans and widows. And Paul's about to give very specific instructions. As I read through this, you might, you might think, well, these are, these are very specific, particular points. What we're going to do is we're going to look at them, and we're going to draw principles out of these because the times that we live in are so different, but the principles in God's Word are timeless. So the first principle that I want to draw out of this is Yes, we still need to help widows in our congregation with their basic needs. Widows are that class of people that society very often would rather not think about because, not because they, they get their, they'll get their hands dirty to deal with it or because widows are bad people, but because it just takes time. It just takes time to reach out and to help somebody. Our society today says, 
well, we'll give you Social Security or we'll give you pension. You might have your retirement or uh, you certainly have your, your property paid off and, and turn on Wheel of Fortune and just sit and, and be happy and, and don't, don't expect a lot from us. But God says that these are the people that we need to care for in our congregation. Those widows, those people who have grown up in church who have been faithful to their husbands, faithful to the Lord, and we're going to find out in a little bit, actually have a lot more to give than society is willing to admit. So even though today's widows may be in a better spot than in ancient times with Social Security, pension, retirement, employment, property rights you can have standing in court, Paul specifically specifically talks about in verse 5, those widows who are all alone who are relying on God for help. The church needs to stand up and be there for someone. In in verse 16, he says, those who are not supported by someone else. So when there are financial needs, the church needs to stand up to help those who otherwise cannot provide for themselves. Mayfair does a wonderful job at this. This is not a a condemning sermon, actually. This is a great thing. I walk into this church, and I'm learning all about how you guys do business, how we do business. And at the end of every, at the beginning of every month, at the end of the service, we take a special offering. It's our benevolence offering. And I talk to the people who administer that, and they administer that with care, but with also generosity. And so for those of you who may be in this congregation, and you find yourself in this place, and maybe you didn't want to speak up for help, uh, yeah, speak up to ask for help, we are here for you. We have opportunities to help you. For those of you who are asking, how can I help? What can I do? One of the things you can do is support this church in the way that we support others. And that is through our benevolence fund, through our giving, through our generosity. But there's other things. There's other things that you can do. Things that we don't think about anymore. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he was talking about all the unseen burdens that a widow may carry. Right? Simple things are things that are simple for you and me. Driving. Just getting around, getting all of your groceries in one trip can, can be a big task for someone who is all alone. Organizing things like medication, y- uh, yard work, housework. But I think the biggest thing that I've seen in my short time as a pastor is the loneliness that people face when their spouse dies. You know how much it would mean to somebody if you were willing to go over to their house and sit with them, to to play cards with them, to watch a ball game, or to bring them over for a Thanksgiving dinner. That takes time. It may be uncomfortable. There are kind of social barriers that prevent us from doing that, but you know what? That's what God has called us to do, to care for those who are alone. Second principle, widows, If I'm talking to you, you have the freedom to live your best life. What's interesting is that in verse 9, Paul actually puts an age limit on this. He says, nobody who is younger than 60 can be put on the list. Now, I realize that some of you are still thriving in your careers at 60 years old. Some of you might feel a little bit offended that that's the number that he put, right? Uh, What do you mean 60? I've still got several good years left, Paul. Don't even think about putting me on a list, right? I know 60 is the new 40, is what I've been told. But in Paul's day, 60 had just become the new 80. So things were different. People did not live as long back then. All right, this is the the time that was generally accepted that, uh, that a woman would have a really hard time starting her life over. Remember, to be a woman in ancient society... You needed a man. You needed a husband or a son just to own things, just to have legal representation, but certainly to have a good, thriving life. It was a time that was seen at 60 years old. It was too late to start a family. And your family, your husband and your sons, was your ticket to prosperity. It was your ticket to a good life. Today, you can still have a thriving career after 60. All right? That's not the number that we stick to. But... If you have the health and abilities to support yourself, do it. Live your best life. But for those who are in need, if you don't have the health and the abilities to support yourself, the church is here for you. 
Our church has already shown that they support those who help, and we need people who are continuing to meet those obligations. Principle number three, God is not done with you yet. So as I studied this, I'm speaking to you widows, and I'm just going to broaden it a little bit because I, I think through some conversations that I've had over the past seven to ten years with folks in the church, uh, there may be a sense that once you hit a certain age that society seems to forget about you or society tells you it's just time to wind down and fade into the background. Let me tell you, God's word says something different. As I studied this, it became clear that this is not God's version of social security. In fact, this is not even charity. This is not simply about helping people and giving them money and then forgetting about them or saying good luck. If you look at verses 9 to 10, Paul says there is a list of virtues before a widow can be put on this list. Let's, let's read it again. No widow may be put on the list if a uh, uh, list of widows and if she is uh, over 60. She has been faithful to her husband and is well known for good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. I don't know about you, but as I was going through this, I, I thought this, this almost reads more like a resume, almost more like a, a job description than a charity application. In fact, all over Scripture, we're told to help the poor. We're told to help the poor, we're help, help orphans, help widows, help those in distress, and never, to my knowledge, are there any requirements attached to that. But in this particular spot, Paul gives this list of things that a widow must uh, have achieved or must be able to put on her spiritual resume before she gets put on this list. It's a little bit peculiar. Did a little bit more research. Verses 11 to 12, I think, are the key, the answer to this. Look at 11 and 12 with me. It says, as for younger widows, do not put them on such a list, uh, for when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus, they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. So he's saying that if a widow goes on the list and then decides to get married or, or live her best life in some other way, that she has broken a pledge. So getting on this list isn't talking about getting on a list of people who are just given money or given things and, and, and you say, okay, uh, go, go away and, and, and go watch Wheel of Fortune. Actually, the scholars that I've uh, read say this is much more like an office of the church. You know, at the church we have several offices. We have elders, we have deacons, we have pastors. We have people who are expected to do things. That's more like what this was. I don't know if this was an office of the church, but what Paul is doing here is he's setting up this system by which these widows, these people that society would rather forget can receive support but also be dedicated to serving Christ through whatever means necessary. And I, I wouldn't go so far as saying that this is a job or this is an obligation on their part, but I, went, I started to think back about some of the people who have made such an incredible difference in my life and in my ministry. Let me tell you about Miss Peggy. Miss Peggy is an 82-year-old widow. And when I uh, stood up and said, hey, I can't take the kids to camp this year because we don't have enough adults who can take time off of work, who can escort the kids to camp. And in Texas, what we did was we went to the camp with the kids and we stayed in the cabins and we ran around and we played games and it was very taxing. I said, we didn't have enough people so some of the girls can't go. She, Miss Peggy, this 82-year-old widow, stood up and said, I will go if you need somebody. I signed up Miss Peggy for camp. I put in all her information on the computer. And when I put, went to put her age in, it was one of those scrolly things, and you select the birth year. They didn't have her birth year. <laughs> so Miss Peggy was two years younger when she went to camp. And let me tell you, she outran every one of those kids. Now, that's not something that I expect every widow should be able to do. All right, this is, this is not the bar. But, man, you talk about a spiritual gift, a filling of the spirit. Let me tell you about Miss Violet. Miss Violet greeted cleaned, raised her 60-plus-year-old autistic son. She stood five foot nothing. And every day she was at the church, 
telling people about God's love. And I remember from my youngest days as a Christian, as a, as a teenager who had just come to Christ, that I knew when I went to Ms. Violet, I could see God's love in her face. She counseled women, she encouraged couples, and she loved everyone. And she's still one of the building blocks that my faith is built on. Let me tell you about Miss Elwanda. Miss Elwanda single-handedly ran the missions at our church. She ran Operation Christmas Child. I know Ben knows that's a lot of work. All those people who are doing those boxes the past few weeks, thank you. She oversaw the kids' ministry. She did a food pantry. She took food to people in our communities who couldn't afford a good meal for Thanksgiving. She counseled women. She encouraged couples. She encouraged us a whole bunch of times. And she loved everyone. And you knew that when you talked to Miss Elwanda, you were talking to somebody who's, who was bringing God's love, who was channeling God's love directly from him to you. She was a part of the growth of my faith. You may be a widow or a widower. Maybe you've got health problems. Maybe you're retired and, and don't think that you have much to give. Let me tell you, God is not so powerless that he cannot use you. There is more for you to do. In fact, I've come to the conclusion, and I say this, but I'm, uh, this is silly, but I'm serious, that widows are God's Navy SEALs, right? Widows are the special forces of the church. You can do things that I cannot. You can speak to people that would not even think about listening to me, and your words and wisdom come with a gravitas that my youth cannot compare with, that cannot build up. You have a special ability to do God's work in this church. No, God is not done with you yet. And so he set up in his word a system that allowed widows, allowed those who had gotten past the years where society was still willing to value, to value them, where they would be put to their greatest and highest task. We care for our widows. We support those who society would rather just say, just go away and retire, because we believe that they have the most to give. That's what it means to be a family. What do you do to support widows? What does it mean? Think about what you would do if it was your mom. If your mom needed help changing a light bulb, would you be there? If your mom needed financial support, would you be there for her? If your mom needed help going grocery shopping, would you be there? If we are the family of God, related by the blood of Christ, will you be there? for those who need you. So we've talked about widows, we've talked about widows specifically and how we can help them, but I think this verse, uh, this chapter also goes beyond that. There's a, a verse in here that is kind of the glue that holds it all together, and I just want to end on that, to focus on that for a minute. Look at verse 8. Let's read that together. It's a hard verse to read. It's not one of the verses that makes you feel good. Paul says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Being a part of a family is work, but it's good work and it's worth doing. I love my family. Addie is about to have her eighth birthday this, this next weekend right during candle walk. I love being there for the birthday parties. I love seeing the growth of my children. Missy and Addie actually share a birthday, so Missy's about to have her <coughs> birthday this weekend. There's nothing better than being part of a family, sharing funny videos online, watching the kids do the, the goofiest stuff, and having a group of people who have your back no matter what. But the fun things are the things that come naturally. The hard times are when it matters. The hard times are when we really become a family, when there is financial stress in our life, when we have problems at school, when we're facing medical issues over and over again, when we're fighting through depression and anxiety and frustration and hopelessness. 
all of those moments when it's hard to be a dad, when it's hard to be a husband, those are the times that matter most. Those are the times when we need to stand up with our family and be there. And those are the times when so many people bail. We have a society that values independence. And so in our, in our culture, it is so easy to pick up, sign some paperwork, end the family relationship, drive off and start a new life in a new place. Scripture says a lot about independence, but it also speaks about interdependence, that we need one another to rely on each other and to be reliable during hard times. I want you to think about how how crucial this is that Paul is saying this. How, how, how critical he is of a person who's not there for the family. He says, anybody who does not provide for his family has denied the faith. Everything about Jesus you have thrown in the trash if you have not stayed faithful to your family. He says here, worse than an unbeliever. The flames of hell are not hot enough for the man who walks out on his wife and kids. For the woman who abandons her husband and her family. Those people who are not reliable, who, who are willing to pack up and leave when they are needed most to be strong and sturdy. The person who chooses pleasure and self and the easy life over walking through the difficulties of family. That person has taken the path toward condemnation, has taken the path straight away from Jesus Christ. Don't be that man. Don't be the man who is unreliable. Be the man who can stand firm in the gap. Like Joseph, who could take the, the beatings over and over, the mockery, and stayed faithful to his wife because his faith told him that she was right. If you've gone down that road, if you're going down that road, if you're thinking about going down that road, let me tell you there's a better road. There is a road that leads to Jesus. If we follow Jesus, we have the example of our family. You know what Jesus did? One of the most amazing things that he did on the cross as he was hanging there, he didn't have many breaths left. He was agonizing. He was dying. He was dehydrated. He was whipped and bloody and beaten. And his, and his flesh was just hanging off of that dead tree. And, and you know what he did? He took a moment. He looked at one of his disciples, and he looked at his mom who was standing there. And he said, she's your mom now. I want you to take care of her. While Jesus was dying, he made sure his family was cared for. Follow Jesus. While, while he was on the cross, the other thing that he did was make sure that you and I are cared for. And even this great condemnation that we just read in Scripture, even this idea that you have denied the faith, that you're worse than an unbeliever, even if you've gone down that path, what Jesus did on the cross as he was caring for his mom, he was also caring for you. His death was covering all of your sins, and he was providing you a light to follow, like that star that the wise men followed to find the baby. He was providing you a pathway to go down that would be hard, it would be rigorous. It would require strength. It would require sacrifice. There are obligations, but it's better. And he says, if you follow me, if you believe in my death and my burial and my resurrection, if you trust me, if you follow my light, even if you've gone down some dark paths, you will find mercy. You will find forgiveness. You will find redemption. But you know what the greatest thing is? You will find transformation. Jesus is the one who makes widows into warriors. He, he says that the people that society would rather cast off, those are the ones I want in my pews. Those are the ones I want active in my church because those are the ones that I'm going to work through the most. And he takes wicked and failed sinners like you and me, and he turns us into saints that can be used to build up his glorious kingdom. That's the message of Christmas. That's why we're here every Sunday. And that's the message that is offered to everybody in here 
today. You may have gone down some, th- some dark paths. You may have gone down some bad roads. You may have done some things that you are deeply, deeply ashamed of. There is a way back. There is a way out of all of that. But it's hard. You have to follow Jesus. You have to follow him all the way to death, all the way through resurrection. And I'm not ashamed to tell you right up here at Mayfair Bible Church that when you come to church and you, uh, you come and worship, that we want more for you than for you to just enjoy the coffee, enjoy the donuts when we have donuts, enjoy the lights and the singing and the preaching when Pastor Michael or Angel are preaching. We, we want more for you than that. We want you to live a life of obligation and duty and sacrifice because it's doing those hard things when you, is when you find life is most valuable. When you find the man or woman that God has called you to be. This great creation called the church. This family. This is the best way to live life. It's hard. It takes sacrifice. But it's the best. And I want to invite you to be a part of that. As Missy comes, she's going to sing a a song today. This isn't a congregational hymn, but this is something I, I would hope that you would meditate on. You would spend some time just you and the Lord thinking through, what changes do I need to make? What paths have I gone down that I need to turn around from? Do I need to make a commitment today to follow my Lord Jesus Christ? Is it worth it to give up all of my sin and all of my pleasure and all, of, all these things that I love? for a better life. I'll ask our, our pastor and our, a couple of our elders, if you just come down as, as Missy sings, we'd be here to receive you. If you need prayer, if you need to make a decision today, if you need to make some changes in your life, we're going to be right down here at the, at the, at the front. We'd love to pray with you.